But that doesn't mean that we're living in entirely different worlds. Einstein, for instance, proved his theory of the random motion, the Brownian motion of little particles suspended in liquids by communicating with a classical physicist that didn't know anything about relativity that was the guy who was conducting experiments in the laboratory. Communication didn't break down because experience is not linguistic. That by itself should have been a proof that the, the Neo-Kantian theory of experience is wrong, but of course, he had too much momentum. He had obama momentum. <laughs> and he just kept going and going and going. And then came the loop. And rescued a theory of subject that was buried, because no one even remembered it, everybody associating the word Hume with all the foundation of all knowledge is sense data, yeah, with an epistemology instead of a philosophy of the subject. Let me then explain what Hume said. He said, myself, my psychic self, the psychological entity I call self, the psychological entity I go to sleep with and then I wake up more or less in a more or less stable form, we can call it the subject, we can call it anything you want to, is simply a crystallization, a hardening, a coagulation in a field of raw sensations, raw intense colors, raw intense sounds, raw intense aromas, raw intense textures, and even inner sensations, raw intense fears, raw intense feelings of security, raw intense feelings of anger, raw intense feelings of humiliation or pride. It is these sensations in their raw form constitute a field in which the baby from the moment he's being born to <coughs> a, a, a year, a year and a half, slowly <coughs> puts everything together in, you know, in something that more or less makes sense, thanks to habit, thanks to the repetition of non-linguistic practices day to day. In more detail, it's not just habit, it's the habitual association of what Hume called of the habitual creation of associations between what Hume called ideas. Ideas normally have a connotation of being linguistic. For Hume, they are not linguistic. They are low intensity replicas of actual sensations. So when I remember the idea of, of the flavor of pineapple, for instance, it's a memory of, a, of it's a low intensity memory of pineapple flavor, not the concept pineapple flavor. When I remember red and I don't see anything red, it's a low intensity replica of the color red that I have seen in my life. Just to give you another, a slightly better way of thinking about this, and now I'm gonna bring Bergson and re Bergson into the mix, because one thing that, uh, you know, they it, 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 Deleuze's following book after Empiricism and Subjectivity was called Bergsonism. He went from Hume from, to Bergson, and he proved in those two books that the idea of the subject, in particular the idea of memory, the concept of memory, in Hume and Bergson were very, very similar. So let me just then use a little bit of Bergson, which we could also trace back to Hume, but perhaps in a less vivid way. There are two ways of thinking about memory. One way, which what we remember is linguistic, linguistically coded facts. For instance, I remember that the, that the Yankees won the, the World Cup in 2003 or 2004, something like that. I remember that fact. But another type of memory completely different than that, and that fact, by the way, can be stored as an encoded representation of a proposition, of a sentence, in the Baroque region of the brain, and I would be perfectly willing to grant that. But now, now think about this. It's, Early in the evening, you are in a cabin in, 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 in the country. You're burning a fire in the fireplace. You can smell the wood coming out of the fireplace, while at the same time you see the shadows being casted by the flames and playing, playing in, the, in, in, in the walls. Suddenly, a little bit of jasmine smell comes through the window. Some plants are just flowered outside, but the wind 
just carry a bit of your jasmine, which combines with the wood into this magical perfume, and someone begins playing a song, a beautiful romantic song in the background that you probably never heard, and that the whole thing seems to be making you so happy. And two years later, you're trying to remember that evening. Do you really believe that what we stored was a photograph of the fire, or perhaps a little movie image of the fire, to which a bunch of little categories for jasmine smell, wood smell, uh, uh, the texture of the wood or the texture of the couch, the, the, the sounds that I was hearing in the background, or are we literally recreating that scene when we remember it? <coughs> literally recreating it as in virtual reality, as if what had been stored in our brains was not a representation of the moment, but the means to reproduce or recreate the moment at a much lower intensity, of course, in our heads. And more importantly, the kind of memory that is, as artificial intelligence people say, content addressable. I'm in a completely different situation. I'm in the middle of Manhattan. I'm watching the Empire State. There's traffic. And yet, all of a sudden, a woman passes with that perfume that smells like jasmine. And the smell of jasmine suddenly reminds me of the smell of jasmine. And suddenly, the entire cabin with the fire and the wood and the warmth and the textures and the music comes back to me. In other words, a little piece of the memory, the jasmine smell, is enough to go into what we store in our brains, which is the means to produce or create that memory again out of ideas, out of raw, low intensity <coughs> sensations. And suddenly that piece of that smell, that piece of the memory recreates the whole smell. Or think about it this other way. Instead of smelling the, the jasmine, you hear the melody. Again, you're in a completely different, different texture, but now the melody not only recreates the visual aspects of the cabin, it recreates the very smells you were smelling in the cabin. Now that cannot be achieved with representation. So what Hume and Bergson have given us is a challenge to the Neo-Kantian theory of experience by using memory as their main source of contention. By claiming memories are not snapshots, memories are not engrams, memories are not stored representations. Memories are, what we really store is, the, um, to, to put it almost in a Marxist way, the means of production of virtual reality simulations in our heads. Now, the position of Hume and, and Bergson has been strengthened in the last 30 years by the study of different amnesias. Amnesias, of course, come in a variety of ways, <coughs> but the two most important ones that have been repeated, you know, you cannot unfortunately experiment with humans, and so you have to wait for someone to have an accident or to or have all, all the kind of trauma that hits that exact part of the brain that that uh, amnesia, but what has to become clear is that one can have an amnesia in which no autobiographical memory is present. One remembers words, one remembers what, was, what, 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 what one was told, one remembers something linguistic, but when asked, well, do you remember the situation when I told you this? No. I remember you told me because I remember the sentence, but I can't picture, I can't recreate the simulation, sorry. Whereas there are other amnesiacs who can remember every single detail of the lived situation with all its aromas and tastes and, and colors and, and, and so on, but who can't remember what you told them yesterday. In other words, amnesias can dissociate these two entire different forms of memory. They show us that both are real, but they also show us that they cannot be reduced to one another. And this is something that Hume have, have already showed us in in his, in his concept of ideas, not of representations, but of low-intensity replicas of raw sensations. 